We're glad you decided to check out this message by Seabreeze Church and hope that you benefit from it. We also hope that you would join us either online or in person on a Sunday. We have a nine o'clock live stream service online, and then we have in-person services on our campus at nine and 1030. So again, we hope that you would join us and we hope that you enjoy this message. morning, everyone. Good to see you. If you're new to Seabreeze, my name is Bevan, and as Elliot said, I'm the senior pastor here, and we're so glad that you joined us today. We are in the middle of a four-part series we're calling The Financial Squeeze, and we're looking at the squeeze we all in different ways are experiencing because of inflation. Last week, I was surprised to see that the, the package of salmon that I bought just a few weeks ago for $24 is now $31, and I think we've all experienced kind of the, the price shock in different areas as we're feeling the impact of inflation. Now, the Federal Reserve has, of course, um, made it clear that they're very committed to do whatever it takes to bring inflation down. And the more recent wording was they're going to bring whatever pain is necessary to, blame, to bring inflation down. So that sounds kind of ominous. Congress has passed the Inflation Reduction Act. And you may not be aware of this, but the state of California is sending out inflation relief payments by the end of the year. So it's all fixed. By the end of the year, we'll be good. <laughs> but the question we are asking in this series is, is what God is doing in the middle of a, a squeeze like this, particularly a financial squeeze? What, what is God's agenda for us in the various ways that we're facing this particular moment in our history? Our key verse for this series contains the, the standing offer that God has to help us whenever we're in trouble. Here's what it says in Isaiah 46, verse 4. Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you, and I will carry you. I will sustain you, and I will rescue you. So God makes it clear that he is the one that made us. Our life is a miracle of his doing. But God did not make us a self-sustaining kind of life. We have needs. We are dependent beings. We are vulnerable from the moment we are born. We need help to stay alive. We need food. We, we need shelter. And we need much more than that. And because we are dependent beings, we are always one set of circumstances away from being in trouble, from being in peril and in real need. Now, thankfully, according to this verse, God doesn't walk away from us after the miracle of our birth. When we find ourselves squeezed in the vice grip of need, and if we turn to God, he offers to help us, to carry us, sustain us, and even rescue us. But there are conditions to God's offer to help, and we've been looking at these conditions. We've been looking at four of them in this series. The first one we looked at two weeks ago was carry my load. God asks us to continue to be responsible for the daily tasks and responsibilities that we all have. Second week, we looked at the need to choose contentment. Practically, what that means is we rein in our spending to stay within the limits of the income that God is granting us. We form a plan and we stick within that plan because we realize the resources God has given us require a stewardship, require a management. We choose contentment. Today we turn our attention to the third condition, that is calm my emotions. Why would it be important to God that we calm our emotions? It's because his offer of rescue and help is an offer of assistance, not an offer of doing everything for us. God does not tranquilize us whenever challenges occur and carry our limp body through the challenges of life. He helps us, but we have to be a part of the process. We have an active role to play. We have to carry our own load. We have to choose contentment and the other conditions. And if we are panicking, if we are anxious and full of worry, we will not be able to focus on doing our part of God's effort in teaming with us. So the question for this morning is, how do you calm your emotions, particularly anxiety? If you're given to worry or if you're worrying about anything, whether it's financial or anything else, how, how do you stop worrying? And that's the challenge with any emotion. Emotions feel very uncontrollable. It seems to us like they, they just rise up in our own hearts and in our minds, and it's like a wave. We just kind of are riding this wave of emotion, and then they shift or they change or subside. But emotions really can be controlled. The word emotion, the root of it is motion. It's emotion. And the reason that's the description of emotion is because our emotions 
are the direct result of our motions. We move, we do something, we think something, and then sometimes immediately, sometimes later, we feel the impact of that movement, of that thought. That's what our emotions are. They are the aftermath of our movement. They are the E part of the motion. It's just like our bodies. When our bodies move, we feel that movement. Just on Friday, uh, my wife and I got the chance to watch the air show from a friend's boat out in the water. So we were on the water for five hours. That night when I laid down in my bed and closed my eyes, I was still moving. <laughs> I wasn't actually moving, but five hours bobbing in that water, my body was still recording that movement long after I had gotten off the water. And that's the way our emotions work. Sometimes, years after we've thought something or experienced something, we still feel the movement of that activity or that thought or that pattern. So what I want to do this morning is give us two movements from the New Testament, one from Jesus and one from the Apostle Paul, that tells us how we can move if we want to calm our emotions, particularly worry. You can't just command worry to stop. You have to move in a, in a direction that will allow you to begin to calm your emotions, to set aside the worry. So here's the first movement of the two this morning. Seek, don't run. The movement is seek. That's the movement that calms. The movement of run is the movement that cranks up the worry. This is from the teaching of Jesus on the topic of worry in the, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. Here's a summary of what he says, and we're going to look at some of the other verses in this passage, but here's his summary, Matthew 6, 31 through 33. So, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Now, we tend to move forward in life using one of these two gears. We run or we seek. Those are the two basic gears that we move forward in life. When we run, of course, our, path, or our pace is fast, but our path is crooked because there's not as much time to think. We're moving so fast. We're not really intentional about our movements. We're running. Seeking is a slower pace, but it's a more thoughtful process. We are slower in our movements, but our path is straighter. Now, whenever we're squeezed, in particular with a financial concern, our tendency is to run, to pick up the pace because we're concerned about a financial need. Jesus identifies the, the three big needs that every human has always faced, and they represent whatever other needs are under them that you might be worried about at this moment. He says, these are the big three, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, what shall we wear? Now, the thing about our needs is they don't walk to us. We must go and find them. We must get our needs met. We must pursue them. Our needs are always moving away from us. The way you know that is because you eat today, and guess what you have to do tomorrow? Eat again. Your appetite is continually moving. You, you've got to keep pursuing. Same thing with drink. Same thing with shelter and all of the other needs. We buy clothes, and then they wear out. Now, when money is tight, our needs are moving away from us at a faster pace. That's really what inflation is doing. It's, it's the, the needs that we have, at whatever level of resources we have, the needs are moving now at a faster clip than they were just several months ago. So the natural response is, we got we to gotta start running. we got to pick up the pace if we're going to catch up to our needs. But Jesus says there's actually a deeper reason behind us picking up the pace the, the panic and the worry behind the running speed of life. He says the real reason behind the run is not that the needs are running faster, it's because you're thinking like a pagan, he says. He says it's the pagans who run. And we hear the word pagan and we 
perceive it as kind of a put-down word. But all it means is someone who does not factor God in as they think about meeting their needs. When it comes to the needs of life, a pagan, literally meaning without God, a pagan doesn't think God has any practical part in meeting the needs of their life. If the mortgage or the rent is going to get paid, it is all up to them. God has no hand in that. He may not even exist. That's the thought of someone who runs. If they will ever be able to retire, it's all up to them. God has no part in that. Now, when you think about it, that is a pretty strong argument. I mean, because no one has ever paid my mortgage but me. God's never paid my mortgage. Uh, I've never looked at my retirement account and found an extra entry with God's name next to it and a little smiley face, a little something extra for Bevan. <laughs> never seen that. It's just me and my wife contributing to our needs. Now, so if that's true and your needs are moving away now at a faster clip, the only logical thing to do is to pick up your pace and start running after those needs and trying to catch them. But Jesus says something amazing in these verses. He says, if you, instead of running to pick up the pace, if instead of picking up the pace, you'll double down your efforts in seeking me and putting me first and putting these things second, your needs, what you will see is you will see me now join you in helping address the needs that you have. I will help add the needs to your life. If you make me first, if you decide to seek me rather than run after all your needs. What does this mean, practically? Should we all just quit our jobs and wait for God to feed us? I mean, should we walk into Ralph's today? When we go to pay, just show them this verse on our phone and say, <laughs> God, God says he's going to meet all my needs, so talk to him. You know, good luck with that. Jesus isn't saying, only seek my kingdom and righteousness and nothing else. He is saying, seek it first. We do have to bear responsibility for our daily needs. We have to address those things. But what he's saying is that in the moment of fear, when you're worried about your needs, the instinct is going to be to ramp up and scramble and panic, but actually it's an invitation to put your life in order to put God at the center of your life and then address what you need to do with your responsibilities around that, after that. And if you do that, Jesus says, it's not just going to be you chasing your needs. It's going to be you helped by me in pursuit of your needs. And I'll see to it that you catch what you need. I'll see to it that your needs are met. Now, if you do the other, then life is going to keep falling apart. If you put your needs first and you decide, you know, once I get to a level of comfort or a level of, you know, that I, I feel good with, then, then I'm going to start seeking God. Then I'm going to start adding the God facet to my life. Jesus says, if you reverse it and you make me second or third or fifth or eighth, things are just going to keep falling apart for you. We have a phrase that we used to describe what it's like to run after all these things in our culture. We call it the rat race. And it brings to mind a couple of rat race images. Uh, the first one brings to my mind is the image of a rat running in one of those wheels. So you, you've seen this kind of thing. And this is a pretty accurate description sometimes of what life feels like. Lots of energy, getting nowhere fast. It's kind of the feel of this. And life really can feel like this. The, pa the, the pace is very fast. I have never seen a rat walk on one of those things. I don't know if it's not possible or if they can't control themselves, but they, just, they run. And this is the way life is. It just feels like we just can't get off this. And it feels like we're getting nowhere. Like a rat, we keep covering the same ground. We buy groceries and we pay rent and mortgages, and then we do it again. And the question you have after doing this for years is, so am I progressing? Am I, am I getting anywhere? The other kind of rat race occurs when a piece of cheese is placed, placed at the end of a maze and a couple of rats or more are in pursuit of this cheese. Two rats go through the maze and try to get the cheese. Again, it's not that difficult to feel like this is what we're doing really on a larger scale. 
I mean, we need stuff. We need some cheese. We need food. We, we need money. And there's a maze full of obstacles between us and what we need. Money is just, it's just not sitting on the sidewalks of our city waiting for us to walk by and pick it up. There are obstacles to get the resources for the needs that we have. And so we find ourselves not only pursuing it ourselves, but we're in competition with other people who are after the same thing. There's only so much cheese out there. And this is the feeling that we get. This is the kind of race uh, that's depicted in the movie by the name Rat Race. I don't know how many saw this 2001 movie, but I want to show you this clip of how this movie begins, this Rat Race movie. So let's take a look at this clip, and then we'll continue. Do you have the keys? Six identical keys. They all over the same locker. That's locker zero, zero, one. Inside the locker is a red duffel bag. Inside the red duffel bag is two million dollars. In cash, fifties and hundreds makes a pile about so big. First one there keeps it all. <laughs> oh, and I put little transmitting uh, devices in your key ring so that I can keep track of you. And uh, that's it. Go. You, you just can't pick people at random. I can do anything I like, Owen. I'm eccentric. <laughs> Go. Wait, wait, wait. So, it's like a race? A race? He's a race. I hope I win. Um, what are the uh, rules? There's only one rule. Are you ready? Here it is. There are no rules. Go. Go. So now, when you say go, you mean just go? Uh, b begin, commence, uh, start moving. Theoretically, you have been racing for about 40 seconds, and so far, Mr. Schaefer is winning because he's nearest to the door. So, in this movie, um, this was entertainment for the eccentric Donald Sinclair and his rich friends. Turns out they were wagering on each one of these individuals. That's what the trackers and those devices were for. And there's clearly something demeaning about putting $2 million in front of a group of people and watching them race and wagering on who's going to win. And one of the questions that we have kind of had, maybe not in this form, but is this kind of what life is? Is this, in essence, what God has done? He's put resources on the planet. He's populated with people who need those resources to live. And now, kind of from the control room of heaven, are we some kind of entertainment for God as he watches us frantically run after the cheese? Is that what's going on? Well, Jesus makes it very clear in Matthew 6 that is not at all what is happening. We are not on this earth to run frantically and then die. And Jesus makes this clear by speaking of uh, two other life forms and how God takes care of them. Here's what he goes on to say in Matthew 6, 26, and then 28 through 29. Verse 26, he says, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. The next life form, verse 28 through 29. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. What is the point that Jesus is making? Jesus is using the example of two different life forms, birds and flowers, lilies in this case, to show us how great our value is. Comedian Lily Tomlin Speaking of the rat race, said this, the trouble with the rat race is that even if you win it, you're still a rat at the end of the race. And that's really true. And that's what Jesus is saying is, you're not a rat. I mean, he actually doesn't say you're not a rat. He says, you're not a bird, you're not a flower. You have greater value than those two life forms. And just look at how God takes care of those two life forms. The, the point that he makes... First, as he said, you're, you're not like 
other life forms in this way. You are the only living creatures on the planet who farm. You sow, you store away in barns, you reap, and if he was speaking to our culture, and you go to the store. You're the only ones that does it. Birds do not have a supermarket. They do not have a farming industry. They are not capable of doing that kind of thing. Every other animal is either grazing or hunting to meet their needs. Farming, of course, is a much more reliable way to come up with food. But it takes intellectual ability to be able to reason and understand the processes of growing and the timing of seasons to be able to come up with a reliable source of food. It takes an intellectual ability. The birds don't have that capacity. You do. I do. But God still takes care of the birds. Then he goes on to talk about the lilies, the flowers. He says the other thing about us as human beings is we are the only life forms that are making our own clothes. Every other living thing doesn't have to worry about its own clothing. Plants can't dress for the winter. That's why they don't survive the winter. We do because we know how to spin and make clothes and purchase them. Now, it is a very good thing that we are smarter because we have a lifespan and some more stability. But it's also a challenge that we are smarter. The challenge is this. Birds and plants, they have more reasons to worry, but they're not smart enough to worry. So they don't. How do birds get fed? God feeds them. How do we get fed? Well, we farm, and if we're not farmers, like most of us, we go to the store and we buy stuff. How do the flowers get dressed? God clothes them, Jesus says. Well, how do we get dressed? Well, we manufacture. If we're not part of the manufacturing of the clothing industry, then we buy them. Now, because we are much smarter, we create more stable sources of what we need. The problem is that we can outsmart ourselves into thinking that we really don't need God because we're this smart. And part of what's been happening over the last several years is we've discovered as smart as we are, the supply chain is not as stable as we thought. Our needs are not as secure as we were led to believe. We are very smart, but we're not smart enough. And the challenge with our minds is that we are smart enough to come up with all kinds of amazing things, but we outsmart ourselves and start thinking we don't need God. And when we do that, the pressure is on. So Jesus gives us a test. First of all, he says, basically, you're much smarter than the birds or the flowers. They're taken care of. Why are you worried about this? But then he gives us a test. Basically, he says, okay, you smart people, let's see how smart you really are. This is what he says in verse 27. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Okay, we can't do that. Why not? Well, we're not smart enough. We're smart enough to understand some of the processes behind the way God has made things, and we can benefit from that. But when it comes to the things that we really care about, like how long we're going to live, we can do things that might look like it's going to, but when our time is up, our time is up. We can't add an hour to that. We're not smart enough to take God's place and run this world. So what that means is we have to trust him. The birds and the plants and the rats don't have to trust God. They're not smart enough to trust God. We are. And because we are so smart, we have to make a choice that the rest of the living creatures don't have to make. Will we worry? Will we use our formidable mental capacity and ability to look forward? Will we use that forward-looking radar in life to generate the fog of worry? Or will we trust God as we move into the future? Again, as Jesus says it, will we run or will we seek God first? A seeker is someone who sets their sights on a goal and stays after it. A seeker is intentional. They're not reactionary. So what is it we are to seek? Jesus gives us two big categories. First, he says, you need to seek my kingdom. God's kingdom is, is his agenda of what he is doing to change this world. 
we can be a part of seeing that advance. The centerpiece of God's kingdom on earth is the church of Jesus Christ. It's where we gather together to advance the mission of God in this community and beyond. Jesus says, you need to put that at the center of your life. That needs to be first. That, that needs to not be an add-on. That needs to be first. And then he says his righteousness. His kingdom is a collective effort. His righteousness is also benefited by doing it collectively, but it's really an individual challenge. Righteousness simply means to do what is right according to God. It's God's idea of what is right and wrong. There are a lot of ideas about what is right and wrong, and those always shift in different cultures. But a seeker's goal, someone who is seeking God's righteousness, is to understand better and better what God has said out of the pages of the Bible and then work to align their life to it. That's what we seek. Now, we may get off track, we may get delayed, but we get back up and we keep pushing in those two directions. Now, if these two are something that you would like to do, you won't, it won't happen. These two are not hobbies. These two cannot be added on to your already busy life. The only way these two happen is if they become a priority, if they become the very center of your life, and then you build the other things around these two. They require constant effort to make a priority. Now, it's not that Christ followers don't pursue physical things. It's just that that's not the big race for them. That's not the chunk of cheese that they're pursuing. This is why we seek to carve out time each day to read the Bible and check our own lives up against what God says is right. This is why we make church a priority, why we connect with each other, why we help each other, because we are seeking, not running through life. So that's the first movement to address our worry. If you're struggling with worry, one of the ways to address it is to adjust your own priorities and make sure that God's kingdom and his righteousness are at the very center. And look at your life. Am I doing that? As we do that, that begins to address our anxiety. The second suggestion is made by the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, and that is this. Pray, don't panic. When you're worrying, pray, don't panic. Again, we can't tell our anxious emotions just to stop. I wish we could. I wish I could just command my heart to say, stop worrying. We can't do that. What we, can, we can't change our emotions. What we can change is our motions. And then the E will follow the motion eventually, not instantly. Just because we decide to seek God first doesn't mean that we're done with worry. Worry will continue to distract us from seeking God first. Worry is a voice that yells, fire, in a crowded room, and it gets everyone scrambling. We listen to it, and we will run from one imaginary fire to another. This is what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 4, 6 through 7. I've known these verses for a long time, and these verses are well-worn in my heart because I need to go through these over and over again. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says this, Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What we really need, I think we could all admit this, whether it's a financial worry or something else, what we need is the peace of God that is beyond our own mental capacity to stand guard over our hearts and our anxious minds. But a general move towards God is not enough of a move for that to take place, to calm our emotions and have peace replace them. So Paul gets very, very specific. I learned years ago, you have to get really specific on this. So I want to get very specific now the rest of our time. Here's what you do if you're struggling with worry. Number one, make a list of everything you're anxious about. It says, do not be anxious about anything but in everything. That's a very interesting phrase. What, what he's saying is we tend to be anxious about anything. In other words, there's no limits to anxiety. Have you noticed that? When worry starts, it never stays on topic. You start worrying about this, and then that, and then that, and it's almost like your, your brain and your heart is just taken over. I mean, just last week, I started worrying about something financial, 
And then I went on to worry about something else, and I just kind of went down this hole of worry, and I ended up worrying about booster seats. <laughs> Had nothing to do with what I started worrying about. My grandkids have just, some of them transitioned out of car seats into booster seats. And after transporting that precious cargo in those 100-pound car seats, it, I'm just adjusting to the safety concerns of a booster seat. So I, that, that just let me know my mind was out of control. I was just going down the worry rabbit hole. And that's what worry tends to do. So how can you stop worry from adding to the seemingly endless list of almost anything you could worry about? You make a list of everything. Not anything, everything. Again, not everything in the world, but everything in your heart. What are you anxious about? Now, for me, this usually helps me right away. I can feel like I'm overwhelmed by anxiety. But when I think about it and I take just two minutes, what I realize is I'm actually anxious about four things or five, sometimes eight. I'm not anxious about everything. There, there's a list. There's a limited list. Get it out. If you have to write on a piece of paper or type it into uh, something in your phone, but get it out of your head. Make a list. Next, present it to God. By prayer is the next thing. Prayer marks a major movement in your thinking. Worry is the attempt to solve the uncertainty of life. Prayer is the admission that you can't. Let me say that again. This is very important. Worry is the attempt to solve the uncertainty of the future of your life. Prayer is an admission that you can't create a certainty in this life. Prayer is the moment when you lift your head up from your circumstances, the circumstances of your life, and you ask God for help. You just take this entire list, it's four things, eight things, 15 things. You take this entire list, and you present the list as a, an entire list to God, and you say, God, clearly I need some help. I don't know how this is going to work out. I need help with all of these. I can't do this. That's the move of prayer. It's just a general God help. Then, after you present it to God, then you go back and get specific. This is the petition part that Paul's talking about. You ask God for specific help with each item on your list. You know, I have a good friend that I have called over the years for advice when I'm needing some help. And I'll usually kind of beat around the bush and talk about it, and we'll catch up a little bit, because I don't want to start the conversation immediately with, hey, could you help me with this? And usually I'm beating around the bush too much, and finally he says, Bevan, what can I help you with? Oh, right, 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 right. That really helps me focus. What do I need help with? And this is what we need to do with God. You know, talk to God, but then eventually, you know, let God say to you, uh, Bevan, what, what can I help you with? And get very specific. In the petition part, we focus specifically on what we want God to do. Sometimes I'll say, God, I need insight because I'm confused. Sometimes I need resources. I don't see how we have enough resources for this. Sometimes... I'm going to have a meeting with someone that, that's got authority, maybe a person in the city when we hit the building thing, and I'll ask God for favor in the eyes of that person for our particular project. Sometimes we ask for protection related to booster seats or other things. But, but just get very specific. What would you like God to do? Ask him. And then give thanks to God. Now, this took me a while to figure out when I was younger because... Saying thank you usually comes after you receive the gift, not before. You know, if I walk up to you and say, hey, thank you for that gift, and you haven't given it to me yet, that's odd. So why are we thanking God before there's been any time for him to address our petition? The purpose of this advanced thanking is to remind us of our true position before God. We tend to think of God like a vending machine and prayer kind of like the money we put in it. Oh, I've got to put a little more money in to get, get what I want out of God. I've got to pray a little bit more, and then God will give me what I want. And therefore, we think of prayer and the relationship as a transactional thing, and it isn't. We need something, we ask for it. God gives it, and we say thanks. That's what we think. This is why you hear people saying, oh, prayer works. I've got examples on that front that would say, sometimes it doesn't. Or it happens differently than I think it should. The truth is, our entire life is a gift from him. So when we say thanks in advance of what he decides to do, 
what we are saying to our heart is this life is a gift from him, and I'm going to thank him before I even know what he does about this. It puts our heart in position and begins to help us trust him and be at peace. Then lastly, leave it there. It says, present your requests to God. The idea is, and don't take them back. You know, don't, don't give something and then say, oh, I, I, I want to freak out about that a little bit longer. Let me have it back. We bring our worries to God not to inform him and then take them back. We bring them to God to leave them. So if it comes back up into your mind, which I promise it will, just pause and say, this is what I say, God, I left this with you. Would you help me trust you with it? That's the reason I take it back. I don't think God's going to do what I want him to do, so I'm going to take it back and (laughs) churn on it some more. You may need to go through this process again and again. There have been seasons in my life, and I would say this is one of those seasons where I've had to go through this at least every morning and sometimes a few times during the day just to get my heart to calm down and get moving in the right direction. So, Let me read this again, Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, these words are written, and Jesus, what you said, are written because clearly we take the considerable mental capacity you've given us the ability to plan and look into the future and we often use it to just be concerned and freak out about the future so i pray oh god that you would help us to trust you you would help us to seek you first rather than run after all these other things as if you have no no role in them at all and i pray you give each of us clarity on on how to move towards seeking in some area of our weekly schedule And then as we deal with worry, I pray, Father, you'd help us to be really clear on what it is, to not just let worry generally consume us, but to get specific, to get out of our heads, and to present it to you and ask you for help. And we thank you for your care and for your help. We ask that you would continue to sustain us. We pray this now in your name, Jesus. Amen.